Good evening and welcome to the U Retina debate that is dealing with genetic testing. We will discuss genetic testing if they are or are not critical to the management of our AMD patients. And we will deal with the question if genetic therapy does or does not have a potential in the near future. For this debate, we invited expert, top experts in the field, all of whom today are women. This is a little bit part of the Euretina effort to have a women leadership a presence and program and will not be the only thing that the Euretina is doing, but we are very lucky to have such experts, all women, that can lead us through this exciting topic. I would like to introduce the speakers. First of all, Professor Emily Chu. Professor Emily Chu is the director of the Division of Epidemiology and Clinical Application at the NEI. And we all know how uh, great a leader Emily, Emily is in the field of uh, clinical trials, uh, non-neovascular and neovascular macular degeneration, as well as other retinal disease. I uh, welcome Emily that will give uh, the no for this motion. It's also a great pleasure to welcome Caroline Claver, who is a professor of epidemiology and genetics in, uh, in Erasmus Rotterdam, and is a great expert in genetic diseases. For the panel, we have a, a Professor Sandrine Sareifel, who is the vice chairman at the Department of Ophthalmology at Zurich University. And Professor Rosa Dolz Marco from Spain, who is a retina specialist at the Macula Unit in, uh, in Spain. And we are very excited to host these wonderful experts on this topic. Together with my co chair, co moderator, Professor Nicole Etter, who is a professor of ophthalmology at Munster, Germany, who will uh, lead the discussion and, uh, and, and conclude the debate. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Caroline Claver to speak in favor of the motion of genetic testing being important, important and having a great potential. Caroline, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Anand. Uh, yeah, AMD and genetic testing is a topic very close to my heart. I've been uh, looking at AMD genes, I think, for the last 20 years now. And it's probably not surprising that I am for. And I hope to convince you that it is definitely going to be something that we will offer our patients in the future. I'm afraid of my opponent, of course, Emily Chu. And in uh, my view, she is totally a superwoman. She has been on the power list for ophthalmology for centuries now, I think. And as a PI, she has led magnificent intervention studies, used her creative intelligence to uh, develop many uh, solutions for our uh, patient care. And uh, I know her uh, personally, she's been visiting us in the Netherlands and uh, I think her, her soul is fierce, her heart is brave and her mind is uh, very strong. So that made me a bit afraid, so I did some training <laughs> Hopefully, this training will help because now I am ready for the fight. So let's focus again why we would want to know what causes AMD and what leads to uh, risk profiles for AMD. And basically, the answer is AMD is not solved as yet. We know from the uh, fighting retinal blindness studies that anti-VEGF solves AMD blindness for about five years. After that, the vision is back to baseline and usually deteriorates thereafter. And of course, with our aging society, we will be seeing more patients. So when we focus on the pathogenesis and see the broader picture, of course, we start with the genes. We have them before birth. Then after birth, we get and we have to deal with our environment. The genes and environment lead to proteins and metabolites, and they lead to subclinical lesions at the tissue level, which after a while turns to manifest disease. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could change this uh, pathogenesis and leave it at a subclinical level? 
So my first argument is genes are the most potent predictors of late AMD. And for this, I will uh, go to the, uh, the big uh, study of the International AMD Gene Consortium, where they did a GWAS in uh, a huge samples of cases and controls. And they found 52 common variants in 34 genes that were associated with AMD. And you can annotate these genes to certain pathways. And we've come up with pathways, the complement pathway, ARMS2, HGRA1, lipid pathway, extracellular matrix pathway, and genes that annotate to various other pathways. Apart from the common variants, there are also rare variants. And right now there are over 100 rare variants known. They are mostly in the complement genes CFH, CFI, C3, and C9. And how do these variants together relate to the risk of AMD? And that is plotted here. Here you can see the minor allele frequency on the x-axis and the odds ratio of late AMD on the y-axis. You see, indeed, there are very high risk rare variants, not all of them, some of them are, are low or moderate risk. But the AMD is very different in its complexity in that it has very strong frequent risk variants, and those are ARMS2, CFH, and C3. And here I've listed that a little bit differently. So here on the bottom, you can see the different variants. And this is the attributable proportion to disease or to being a control. And you can see about half of these uh, variants are actually increasing the risk, but about half is a protective. And it's really the combination of what you inherit that makes you susceptible for disease. So to, to look at that uh, better, people have defined polygenetic risk scores or genetic risk scores. And they actually are based on all the risk variants together. They are the sum of the betas of association and it is a continuous outcome. Uh, when it's negative, you have more protection. When it's positive, you have more risk increase in variance. And here I plotted the distribution in the Rotterdam study, population-based study, and on the left bottom. And you can see that actually the mean is a little bit above zero, meaning that the population at large is at slightly increased risk of uh, late AMD. And we are here on the right, we stratified these uh, genetic risks uh, in the various uh, phenotypes above the controls. The middle is the intermediate AMD and the bottom is late AMD. And you can see that the polygenic risk score is shifting to the right. So not many uh, patients with late AMD now have a negative PRS. What you can also do is uh, make these PRSs pathway specific to see in, in, the, in a patient how much of that disease contribute, of the genetic risk contributes to the disease, what pathway is playing a role. And you can see the highest contribution is from the combination of complement and ARMS2. And it actually plays a role in more than 90% of our late AMD cases. What you can also see is that late AMD have higher PRSs for each pathway, higher than intermediate AMD. Now we all know that late AMD comes from intermediate AMD. So it actually means that those intermediate AMDs with a high genetic risk will be more likely to develop late AMD. So um, prediction modeling is something that we've been uh, doing over the years. Uh, here I'm showing you the, the prediction model of the Rotterdam study and in the population-based alien study. In Rotterdam, we have about 20 years of follow-up. In, uh, in France, it's about 10 years follow-up. And together, you can look at the most potent predictors, and they're actually a combination of the phenotype, the genotype, uh, age, and environmental factors. And together, those factors explain with 92% accuracy who will develop late AMD in the next 20 years. Now, 
Um, already some years ago, we looked to see what is more important in, in terms of prediction. Is it genetics or is it the phenotype and environmental factors, you know, the, the traditional clinical uh, factors that you can do uh, in your clinic? And here you can already see, and at that time we only knew 26 risk variants, that genetics were, uh, had a higher um, accuracy of prediction than non-genetic factors. And this is recently validated by uh, a study in Erin, very well known to, um, to Emily, where uh, people with a high genetic risk score have a higher risk of progression, of drugs and progression, than those with low genetic risk scores. You can use genetic testing without having a phenotype uh, to see you know, what will uh, end up, what you will end up with at the end of your life meaning you will have a population risk of 13%. After testing, it can vary between 3% and over 60%. But what's important for intervention studies is that they can use this information, the genetic testing for pathway-specific disease scores. So if you have a target that uh, targets a specific um, uh, genetic trajectory, it will be good to do genetic testing. My second argument is that genetic testing increases the validity of your diagnosis. So we've actually made a genetic test in the Netherlands and it includes 52 AMD SNPs. It includes the sequence of the complement genes and it includes the total sequence of several macular dystrophy genes. And when we did that in the IRIS consortium, the, you know, these diagnoses were usually made by very experienced ophthalmologists we did uh, learn that there was misclassification. Some of these cases were actually pattern dystrophy or Stargardt's disease or were butterfly-shaped pigment dystrophy. So, and, and also interestingly, those, all these subjects had low genetic risk scores for AMD. And this is of course important for trials and interventions. Argument three is genetic testing will benefit the outcome. And this is uh, a bit philosophical. So you get your genes by nature, but what turns out of your genes is actually in your own hands. And we know that genetics make smoking worse or smoking makes the genetic outcome worse. And we know that actually there are also good things with lifestyle, a healthy diet can lower your genetic outcome. And this has also been shown in the uh, ARID study. We've done uh, this study uh, in the IRIS consortium where we had uh, thousands of people genetically tested. And we also made um, genetic risk scores, but we also made risk scores of lifestyle uh, based on smoking and, and eating habits. And when you look at the combination and you look at each tertile of genetic risk, you can see that a favorable lifestyle, so eating healthy, no smoking, reduces that genetic outcome by almost 50%. So we have a slogan, you have to live your genetic risk away. So people often tell me, okay, this is all very nice theoretically. Nobody's going to change his lifestyle after the age of 70. Well, there are other, uh, there are reports about this, and this is actually in the non-ocular uh, journals. And they looked at uh, direct-to-consumer testing in non-diseased individuals. And then they already saw that these people were no, no disease, that having a genetic test actually made them live healthier afterwards. And what did that healthier life consist of? A healthier diet, more exercise, and vitamins and supplements, things that are very familiar to us for AMD. My last argument is that I actually think genetic testing should not be a doctor's decision. It's a bit paternalistic in my view. So this is the statement of the AAO. I think we'll hear all about it uh, in, from Emily. But what it comes down to is that they say, don't do it because there is no treatment or, uh, you know, that is uh, um, uh, fixed upon these genetic risks. Well, are we doctors only about treatment? So let's ask the patients, and this is also done in the States. These were non-diseased family 
members of people that did have a family history of AMD. And whatever the outcome, already 97% found it very informative to have their genetic risk. And already 53% made lifestyle changes or were more motivated to maintain a healthy lifestyle. So patients do care. So I think the AAO should actually follow the, the, the global trends in medicine and society. Medicine is also about prevention. And this is actually something that the, the UK government has focused on. They wrote a big document, prevention is better than cure. And the Minister of Health actually says, healthcare services need to fundamentally change to tackle the causes of poor health, not just the symptoms. Other people in the UK are teaching us about polygenic risk scores, how to use it in our clinic. People in Asia are actually changing their attitude uh, and dealing with genetic testing in the clinic. People in Italy are using polygenic risk scores to deal with Alzheimer's disease and ask the people, you know, the, the general public, already 26 million people have taken at-home genetic testing. So in conclusion, why, what, and how should genetic testing for AMD be done? Why? Because it's a very potent predictor. And important, it offers patients a chance to fight back with their lifestyle. It can help select patients for trials and future interventions, and patients want it. More than 95% of patients find genetic testing informative. So what do I think genetic testing should consist of? It should be done comprehensively. So do the whole thing. Get all the common and rare variants that you can find. Add some uh, genes that mimic, uh, mimic AMD but are not actually AMD. Do I think it should be a direct-to-consumer thing? No, I don't. I think there should be certified laboratories doing our genetic testing and we should train doctors in how to deal with the results of these, of these tests. Teach doctors polygenic medicine. And then, of course, the important thing is provide patients insights in their options to lower their genetic outcome. So things that are uh, happening is, uh, it's a whole field actually happening in be behavioral change, a whole discipline. People are using, for instance, behavior chain wheel, which is shown here. Uh, or coaching to see if people can change um, lifestyle for the long run. So I hope I have convinced you uh, with my uh, muscles <laughs> that uh, you should do a genetic testing. It is something for the future. I would like to thank my collaborators of IRIS because I used a lot of their data and I want to thank my uh, research group in Rotterdam. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That was really convincing, I have to say. Um, I really understand the importance of uh, doing genetic testing and the potential. And now for the no motion, I'm going to invite Professor Emily Chu, which will tell us that it is not critical and does not have a great potential in the very near future. Emily. Well, thank you for having me. As you know, I come reluctantly. It's always hard to debate Caroline, who has great data. And we are, we're great friends. We know we know what we think. And um, and she actually has a lot of great points to, to bring in. I think it's a matter of philosophy, how we actually get, get the findings that we want in the end. And uh, there are many things I agree with her. Uh, but from our point of view, we, we don't have the, the actual. Uh, and, and part of it's because I think we have a sort of unwieldy type of system of healthcare in the United States, which is different. I think some of the single payer systems have a better way of doing this. Um, right now, it, it's it's a difficult situation. And I'll tell you why that is. Um, and, you know, as my question is, that it's, I think Carolyn is right. It's not, it's not too far. It's really not yet at this point. The genetic testing doesn't alter our current treatment of the management in patients, especially in the secondary prevention, such as ARIS or ARIS through supplements, or doing active therapy, whether genetics will actually alter that. And there's no therapy proven to be genetically specific at this point. We're working on it, but we don't have that yet. We know the genetic association with Mediterranean diet, observational data, but certainly very important. And 
and I, Caroline, she has some very interesting data. Uh, the fact that you can live away your genetic risk, you can eat away your genetic risk, which I think is very important. Uh, there's no prospective study of testing and the value of genetic testing. Uh, and of course, there's the, for us in the country where, where healthcare is very expensive, the expense and burden of genetic testing is a problem. And as Caroline alluded to, we tell the patients, you know, you want to get genetic testing, but physicians themselves don't really understand the genetic test themselves. They don't understand about the rare and common variants. We start throwing them at them. They'll, we really need a lot of education as we go forward. Uh, and I think recommendations of our professional organizations has been, as Caroline alluded to, no testing. And so I'm going to just focus a little bit more on, on this aspect of it as well. So you heard a great deal about the genetics, which has been fantastically done. A lot of it done by Rotterdam and the IRIS has done a terrific job. Uh, just remind you that there was one little lonely spike in the Manhattan uh, plot from 2005. And since then, there's been an explosion of data. And that's because of collaboration. The collaboration between all of us has been really, really important. So what you say in the UK and, and, and EU itself, we are really listening to because it's really important to listen to each other. And, and with the whole group, the 26 clinical sites together, or clinical studies put together, you see this, uh, this Manhattan plot that Caroline has talked about. This has been the backbone of our genetic um, work. And, and I didn't want to go into all the uh, mechanisms that I thought Caroline would, and she did. It was really nice, all the pathways. And they really give us a great deal of information. So genetic testing is paramount for research. It's really, really important for us to move forward, thinking about what drugs we might be able to use, what could happen uh, with progression, et cetera. So the problem is we don't know a lot about the genetics. We don't even know what it actually does. Most of these genes are non-coding areas. Uh, this is a paper from Robin Geimer and her group uh, in the University of Mel Melbourne suggesting th this is a blueprint for what we can go forward to try and learn more about the functional aspects of the genomics. We don't really know what each of these mean. And I think with time and uh, metabolomics that Carolyn's done and other people have done a lot of work on expression profiling, the RNA sequen sequencing and all the work that will come from organoids, et cetera, will all add up to more information that we need. So that's still part of the genetics, which is really important to do. And personalized medicine is what we really want to do in the future. And this is already occurring in cancer, you know, breast cancer, chronic myeloid leukemia, and especially for something like acute myeloid leukemia. This is, they actually use a custom 43 gene next generation sequencing panel to look at each patient to see, and this is a prospective study in the, in the phase three trial, and they did find differences between these different uh, genetic mutations. And in the end, uh, they, were, they were to conclude that differential mutation profiling could really have different outcomes for first line treatment. So patients are treated in cancer very much so with genetics. So that really is sort of the goal where we like to be ourselves. So there is such a study looking at this. They targeted factor D uh, by the study in Mahalo by the, by the uh, Gen Genentech group. Uh, they were looking at geographic atrophy of, uh, of associated with macular degeneration. This was the injection of a uh, factor D uh, inhibitor, the alternate complement pathway. And this was injected uh, intravitrally. And this is the phase two trial showing that indeed that there was a 20% treatment effect with lapilusimat compared to the sham pool group. But what's interesting is that they looked at complifactor I and found that there was a difference. So we thought, this is really interesting. There's some genetic differences. Well, this is gonna be what Carolyn's talking about. There's a genetic influence. If we see that, that would be very important. Um, so they, we actually looked at our data um, in areas and we couldn't find a difference between progression and GA progression um, in, in, in complifactor I. Uh, I think others have done that as well. And, and so they went to the phase three trial, and unfortunately, the phase three trial, much to our disappointment, because we really wanted some treatment to be effective for these patients who have no really no, no proven treatment, not to loosen that failed. And you can see that the, the treatment and the sham group were on top of each other in this phase three trial. And when we looked at complifactor uh, compl 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 I, again, there was really no difference in the end. So perhaps it was a small number that, that gave us that, that, uh, that miss that misleading aspect of it, and perhaps it was just patient ascertainment in some way. But in any event, uh, that didn't prove to be, but that's the sort of thing we would love to have for genetic testing, because that would be a treatment that would be important. So there is a trial coming up, and this is in my gyroscope, which is looking at um, geographic atrophy. This is subretinal injection of, uh, of this GT 
uh, 055, which is a uh, non-replicating adenovirus vector encoding a, a human complement, this is a complement factor that's being injected. And this study is going to uh, finish uh, by 2025. So hopefully this will be something that would indeed be the reason why Carolyn says we've got to get genetic testing if this is proven to be a very important treatment. So I think that's something we're looking forward to seeing. Uh, and and I know the next thing is for genetic testing for diagnosis. And already um, this beautiful paper has been already presented by Carolyn talking about their work, which I greatly admire because it does help with the common and rare variants and the issue of AMD mimicking uh, dystrophies. Uh, I don't know how, I, I understand there are obviously always misclassifications that happens you know, everywhere, both in studies and in clinical practice, and whether we can help, that would be a tremendous help if we can actually improve our detection of AMD. And that certainly is a reason for suggesting that. So I just wanna say a couple of things that we've looked at, and we looked at genetic risk score uh, with this group of um, collaborators, uh, Ray Chen and, and Dan Leakes and, and Ying Ding from University of Pittsburgh, uh, my colleague from and NEI, uh, Nanswa Rupin Rinke, as well as Michael Klein, who's been our long-term uh, ERITS-1 and ERITS-2 collaborator, along with, um, with Lars and, uh, and Gazella Apicasis, Lars Rich from University of Michigan. Uh, we published two papers looking at the genetic risk score and, and also looking at GWAS as well. So our secondary goal was to develop a prediction model for progression and assess the genetic effects on AMD progression. Uh, this including a number of other factors and so we looked at models that based on age, education, and smoking, which is really rudimentary. And, and we saw what, what Carolyn showed in hers. Uh, and we then added genetic risk score as well. Then we also looked at a different model where we looked at baseline AMD severity score, as well as that of the fellow eye. And then we add together the, the demographics, the baseline age, education, and smoking. And finally, we added genetic risk score to the, to the whole work. So that's sort of the, the, the five models that we reproduced. And these are the results. We showed that with Asian education and smoking, it's not bad, you know, 0.62. With genetic risk score, I really bumped it up to 0.75. But a baseline severity itself was a huge one. So the fundus findings was, a, was better than anything else, was 0.88. We added baseline aging education to it, and again, it bumped it to one point. And when we added a genetic risk score, we were not able to increase it much more. So it turns out that the genetic risk markers added a little to the predictive value of this particular risk model. This overwhelming factor seemed to be the fundus findings and the presence of large Jews in the pigmentary change seemed to be driving this. And perhaps the most important predictive test is the dilated fundus or a color a fundus photograph. And certainly the patient should be examined. That would be very important. So we looked at genetic interactions. You know, Carolyn talked about the Mediterranean diet, which they found in their studies, and we found it in the ARIS, both Dr. Merle, and, and the work that we've done with ARIS-1 and ARIS-2, that indeed that there was a, a beneficial effect. You are what you eat. Mediterranean diet can help you eat away your genetic risks, and it's certainly very important. We look at the genetic interaction. What is, what is the impact of genetics on the response to the Mediterranean diet? And we found that there was no genetic interaction with the Mediterranean diet in the combined ARIS-1 and ARIS-2 population, so it didn't seem to make any difference. However, when we looked at the um, genetics of uh, interaction with Mediterranean, and, and specifically for a subtype geographic atrophy or knee vascular AMD, uh, this was significant for, um, for geographic atrophy. When you look further into this, it was driven by fish, the fish intake. And interestingly, it's, the, it's as Carolyn says, you know, it's not... Genetics is not so simple in, AR, in, in AMD. It's got both protective factors and harmful factors. In this case, it's the protective alleles of complement factor H, which seem to have increases your risk or increases your protection from developing GA. So instead of like 30% reduction, it becomes like a 50 or 60% reduction. So you can't afford not to eat well if you are in fact have that genetic risk score. So is it reason for genetic testing? We think not likely because certainly in our cardiology world, uh, that is actually the, the, the diet they propose, that everyone should take a, a, a twice a week diet of, of fish that would be very harm, very protective of cardiovascular disease. So we do that without really genetic testing. But perhaps motivation might be, might be an important aspect of this. Um, certainly, I, I can't argue that. And, and the studies have been shown that Caroline showed you, and I've seen them from, the, from Dr. McCarthy and others, that patients do like genetic testing. And if it motivates them, well, that would be really important. 
So one last thing I want to talk about is using uh, AI to, to look, look to see whether we can look at genetic risk factors for this. So we looked at current prediction of AMD progression. And currently we have the calculator. A number of people have calculators. Up there's an ERITS calculator. And we also use the ERITS simple severity scale. For those of you who are not familiar with it, we just count on your fingers whether you have drusen or pigmentary change. If you have it in both eyes, it's, it's a score of four. If you have advanced disease in one eye, it's five. In four or five, you have a 50% chance of progressing to late AMD in five years. If you only have three factors, it goes by a half to 25%. You only have it in one factor, it's only 12%. So it's a simple scale that you use on the fly when you're seeing patients. So that's what we also compare it to. We explored uh, the use of deep learning for prediction of AMD risk. We evaluated ERITS 1 and ERITS 2 separately and then combining the two. Uh, and this again, using fundus photographs. We're developing what we call a deep C uh, network in which we're using uh, these neural network using both eyes of each patient. As we know, the fellow eye has a lot to do with what happens to your study eye. So using these manually annotated images with ERITS 1 and ERITS 2, we fed them through several models one was called a deep feature in which uh, we don't pretend or, or train it. It picks up its own features, that's important. The deep learning grading of using Drusen and pigmentary was also used. And then we put this into a survival model, looking at uh, sex, age, and, and other smoking and, and other inf information. We did not add a nutritional aspect to that, but we did add a genetics in that. And the genetic information, uh, and much to our surprise, did not improve this accuracy of this. We then put it into a survival model and have the progression uh, predicted with, with a professional hazard ratio. So here's a desktop um, a application showing such a case. Here's a 65-year-old gentleman who was seen uh, and had uh, large drusen, uh, was correctly diagnosed by the algorithm, and also had pigmentary change. We wanted to know, we can ask, we can ask them for one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, eight year. What's what's your what's the risk at those different years? So we asked for five year, and, and we didn't know the genetics of this patient. And we calculated that the late risk of late MD is sixty seven percent, and risk of any GA is about 48 percent, and risk of vascular AMD is twenty nine percent. And when we looked at this, it was a high prognostic accuracy with a five year C statistic, which is like an area under the curve, was about eighty six point four. It was substantially better than the retina specialists using their uh, that's a simple scale. And here we are looking at the, tra the patients trained at our, uh, the, the algorithm trained on both ERITS 1 and ERITS 2 at five years. So the deep feature survival just sort of uh, un unbiased, they just went and did it, was, was actually the, the best of all the models compared to deep learning with, with training for Drusen and pigmentary change. Uh, the calculator did not do quite as well, and the specialists also did not do as well. Uh, and again, this is ERIT2 ERIT separately, and ERIT2 combined uh, was much better. And, and these are, again, the best features, we, what, the easiest to do was actually geographic atrophy. But again, we were disappointed that adding genet genetic data did not improve the accuracy. Uh, and this, uh, as I say, we developed this to, to, to help us um, predict. And this, again, would be important for us for, for studies in the future, for uh, for for patient care, if we, we can find a, a good way of validating this in other populations as well as using real world populations as well. I'm going to end with, uh, as Carolyn predicted, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, professional uh, organizations who've given this uh, quite a bit of thought, and also the FDA itself, the Food and Drug Administration on Genetic Testing. And they ultimately hold the card in terms of what needs to be done uh, in, in the, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, in April of 2017, there was approval of a consumer genetic test, which I agree with Carolyn and we don't think this should be promoted. I think it's hard to get a genetic test from 23andMe and we know how to interpret that data. It's very hard for the patient. At that point, they were allowing patients to uh, approve it for, for Parkinson's disease and late onset Alzheimer's disease was, was done. In 2020, they looked at genetic association and, and medications, whether there's interaction between that. So that was uh, what was actually approved by the FDA. There was a task force at the American Society of Retinal Specialists. This is now four years old. Uh, the use of genetic testing for management of AMD. Uh, they looked at uh, specifically for before treatment or secondary prevention with a supplement. Uh, they also uh, also proposed, as Carolyn proposed, that the patients should go to a clinical lab laboratory improvement amendments or CLIA approved laboratories with expertise in genetic sequencing. 
uh, it's very important. And they, they concluded genetic testing is very, very complex. There's no evidence that management of persons with higher genetic risk scores more frequently with office visits result in better outcomes. So I think if we're gonna do that, we may need to do a randomized trial, uh, but maybe very hard to do. Uh, and secondly, uh, it, they felt that persons receiving antivascular growth factor therapies uh, did not have any uh, real benefit and was not recommended to have genetic testing prior to their treatment. And I think most people agree with that. I think the more sticky and more controversial part is the issue of uh, Complifactor H and, and, and the um, proposal by uh, one particular drug maker uh, group that, that there, indeed that there's harmful effect uh, uh, with the Complifactor H as well as the, the, the zinc in the uh, carrot supplement. The study was not replicated by our other researchers, namely ourselves. Uh, genetic testing prior to ERITS-1 and 2 was not recommended by this particular group. Uh, and of course, uh, you heard from Ed, Ed, uh, Ed Stone and uh, has headed this task force for American Academy of Ophthalmology, which discussed the, the different aspects of, of genetic testing. And again, they they speci you know, really specified the importance of, in research, which we really like to emphasize. Uh, and they hope also genetic testing in the near future will help us predict progression and also prevent uh, prevent for uh, prevent disease and, and future treatment might be helped by this. And at least what they said for now, let's, let's avoid a genetic testing. Uh, Jenna Wittes and, uh, and, and David Musk wrote an editorial, and, and this was based on the issue about genetic testing for prior to ERITS-1 and ERITS-2 supplements, at least it was ERITS-2 supplement. And again, we, we found really no, ev no evidence of, uh, of this. So the genetic uh, uh, testing was done actually by a, trip, a different group, which was three different independent independent groups that were asked by the NIH. Uh, my bosses, the, 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 the actual leaders of NIH, uh, took my data and the data from uh, the Arctic DX uh, uh, personnel and other folks and, and evaluated that. And they found errors in, in data and used to support the initial claim. And they felt the patient should be offered vitamins without consideration of genotype. Uh, and again, this is uh, Ed's thought, uh, which uh, is that there's, there's such an interplay between them, the cost and the risk of routine genetic testing outweighs the benefits and for Asia is not generation. And that's the final opinion of this group is that no genetic testing for AMD should be recommended. Unfortunately, it's not only that, but there's also healthcare health policy makers, um, you know, people who are at risk of macro generation, at least in our country, are often people on fixed incomes, they don't have a lot of income. And, and if the health policymakers do not actually support this, the insurance doesn't support it, and it becomes extremely expensive uh, for patients to do this. So that's something we have always in mind to, to be concerned about. Uh, and certainly there are genetic testing, like 23andMe and others offer this, uh, and should be done for dietary recommendations. We, we've always gone through this. We think no, because there's no prospective data to support such testing or prediction for progression. And genetic testing, of course, is not recommended as I, I discussed. I'd like to thank all of my, my pals from the, from, the, from the clinical center and from my ERITS-1 and ERITS-2, and also all my colleagues here who really have such a healthy discussion about this. I think these are important things to discuss, and I know that Carolyn has brought up some very important points, and I, I certainly think from, from this point of view that we're getting close. I really hope we can get to that point and provide personalized medicine and provide better care for our patients. And, and, and furthermore, a much better prediction of who, who will progress and be important for our clinical trials in the future. Thank you for your attention and thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you both, Caroline and Emily, for these excellent talks. And uh, please let me ask the, the first question. You both have been talking about the genetic biomarkers and we're also mentioning imaging biomarkers. So maybe the question to to the both of you. If I have a patient and I would know about the genetics and uh, I see the imaging biomarkers, you mentioned the Drusen and, and uh, other changes, what would be uh, the most important factor to foresee the development into a late AMD? Maybe Caroline, would you like to start and, and then Emily? Or, or maybe, Emily, would you like to start? That we lost you, Carolyn. <laughs> um, so to me, the data have certainly suggests that the fundus exam is so important. 
when we look at the odds ratios of, you know, um, I, I didn't bring the risk factor as as we've done in areas one and areas two, just having Druzen and pigment just bumps you up, you know, to, to a huge odds ratio. So having an eye exam is really important. Uh, and furthermore, it allows us to know that the patient is indeed at a stage intermediate AMD who would then need treatment. Um, so uh, I think I think it's nice if you had genetics that could predict the future, but we know from our our data that no one that have intermediate AMD, they are really uh, they are really susceptible or are really open to having treatment with an ERIT supplement, and that's the time for us to, to start having that conversation. Uh, and we often get patients whose children uh, of, these, of these parents who have, um, you know, severe AMD, and they want to know, um, you know, I often tell them, get your eyes exam. I think that's probably one of the most important things is to have an eye, eye exam and, and then be, be very on the lookout. And if, once you get in the large I think it's really important. Um, oh, Carolyn's back. Okay. Yeah, right. sorry, I uh, got the microphone and then it disappeared. I thought it was a stunt from you, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have magic powers, Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I don't know what you, what you said, but I, well, I, I do think... I think the fundus exam was really important uh, from, from our point of view of looking at the data and how it really does predict a, a lot of progression. But certainly if you have someone who, who's at intermediate stage, you want to know that they have that and, 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 and start them on some air supplement. I mean, obviously, if you can have someone who's like a, a parent with a child who, who may have the risk and it may genetically you might find that. But but on the other hand, it's, it's, it's not so pure. It's not like just because you have that that gene, you're gonna get that disease. So so perhaps that motivation is there to say you have that gene, you better do this, this, and this. And and you could eat away your your your, your risk. You could live away all these harmful effects. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I agree to that. I can see, you know, when your genetic risk is most prominent for late stage uh, and we all go through the different stages, it means it is a driver. And, and um, so there will be people with intermediate AMD with low genetic risk who will progress uh, uh, less fast or may not, may not progress to late AMD. So uh, I don't think it's the most important because I think you need the whole story, but it's, it's definitely a, a huge driver uh, all the way to the end stage and, and that part because it's all the way to the end, end uh, stage is important information for our, our future therapies. Okay, great. We have already uh, a couple of questions uh, in, in, in the chat, but before we will address those, um, and maybe uh, I, I want to bring some Sandrine and Rosa into the discussion, and maybe Sandrine, if you want to start, um, what's what's the state of the art? What's your opinion uh, from Switzerland? I mean, first, I would like to congratulate uh, to both excellent speakers. I mean, these were like amazing talks from both of you. Um, I also have a question, actually, which uh, could be addressed to uh, to both of you. I mean. I think in, in the perspective of, of a patient, wouldn't it be nice to have a more personalized uh, approach, you know, like for diagnosing and treatment? Could be like one reason um, you showed that very nicely, uh, Emily, that genetic markers added little to the predictive uh, value of, of the risk. Could be one reason that we actually don't have the whole picture that we don't know all like the, the genetic variants, maybe like the more rare ones, which might be also very important for some individual. Could that be one reason that we just, you know, we don't have enough knowledge yet for actually recommending genetic testing? That, that, could, that could be true um, for sure. And I think in terms of, of the genetic risk score, uh, it's pretty powerful. We do have, you know, a lot put in there. But as Carolyn and others have said, we we haven't discovered all the rare variants, and, and they may be very important as well too. And we just don't have that. So maybe the picture is incomplete at this point, and and there are more to be discovered. Um, you know, discovery of this continu continues on. And that's why it's so important for us to really continue to do this genetic testing in some way or other. And and I think that's really important. Yeah. So, uh, Rosa, how about Spain? 
What's your opinion? Well, I think uh, all the points uh, we have been discussing are really important. I, and I wanted to really uh, include, do you think that including other imaging modalities, because we are really lucky right now and we have not only Fundus imaging, but also other imaging modalities, you, do you think that will make also a difference? And uh, I think one of the points that uh, Caroline mentioned about the risk between being intermediate or late AMD, I think it's really uh, important. You think imaging could help adding, for example, OCT biomarkers? So maybe oh, Emily or something. Take, yeah, sure. Yeah, OCT definitely is a really important biomarker. We still haven't explored all as much as we can. Uh, we're just starting to look at some of our OCTs from ARIDS2, which is longitudinal. Um, and I know Carolyn's got plenty from hers from the Rotterdam. And there definitely are some very important aspects. The, the group called the CAM group is looking at, uh, at this very specifically and looking at, uh, especially for geographic atrophy, all the precursors that come before it and whether we could get better uh, biomarkers of who's predicting who's gonna go, you know, fast progressors or not. And, um, and, the, and whether, whether the, the area is different from a lot of different risk factors that, that a number of, number of us have looked at. Uh, so I think OCT is indeed a very important part. Uh, and it's important for so many things, not just for diagnosis and for monitoring disease. You know, we're gonna get to a point where we're, we're monitoring people at home with an OCT application. So the OCT is going to be extremely important and, and it can help us personalize, uh, you know, what type of uh, AMD we're going to have. Yeah. Great. So let's, let's look Carolyn, at it. Go ahead, Carolyn. You want to? Yeah. No, so, so I, I agree that uh, very good phenotyping will uh, help prediction, uh, prediction to late AMD. But still, I mean, you're doing phenotyping, right? Which is very different from genotyping. And, you know, the genotyping can be a driver, an important predictor before you have a more full-blown disease. And I think, uh, you know, when there's a huge intermediate AMD and everything is happening, then genotype is probably not going to add because you already have the visual outcome of your genotype. But before you have this, I think the genes will be more important in, in uh, being the predictor of, the, of disease endpoints. Let's have a look at, at some of the questions uh, yeah, from the audience. So we have one, many, actually. We have many. Yeah, really, uh, really a lot. So thank you, thank you to the First audience. First of all, we have a question from our president. I think we should address the question of uh, that um, was uh, asked by Professor Holtz. Uh, so Professor Holtz is asking if, besides genetic and morphological predictors, uh, do the speakers and maybe the panelists? Uh, it would be also good to hear. Uh, maybe a Unicol and Sandrine and uh, Rosa, in addition to the speakers, role for functional assessment in discriminated high versus low risk, in addition to what was mentioned until now. Emily, you want to take this? Yeah, no, Frank, the, 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 the um, functional aspects is, is hugely important. Uh, and I think we're learning that as you are doing in the MACUSTAR and, and we're hoping to do some work in the early AMD eras, uh, we've kind of neglected that to a certain extent. I think there's much more work being done looking at microperimetry, looking at dark adaptation, uh, and those those are really, really important. And they might become a very important part of our, again, it's, it's a phenotyping, right? Carolyn says not the genotyping, but the phenotyping might help us predict uh, future progression, um, you know, people with RPD who have more dark adaptation problems, uh, that certainly is something that needs to be addressed and, and certainly would be a, an important part of this. Yeah, great. Um, so uh, let's let's move on to the next question. What about geographic atrophy? Um, how do you see genetic testing there, um, risk for progression? Is it more genetic or uh, you know imaging? Because we know we we have seen a lot of different types of geographic atrophy. We see uh, different uh, types of edges, and we know that, for example, the diffuse trickling type is more uh, progressive than the others. How about genetic testing in in those patients? So shall I take this one? Um, so uh, I want to mention that the genetic diversity in the end stages is not that huge because you're almost not getting there without having a genetic risk. 
So for instance, for late AMD, already 65% are carriers of ARMS2. And so when you have a pool of so high genetic risk um, people, uh, the genetic risk is not doing much for your prediction. And uh, so I don't think we should use um, genetic tests to predict progression of disease uh, in, in the end stages. It's more the road towards the end stages. Okay. So another question would be, do you think there should be many more new genetic risk factors to be discovered in the future? Maybe Caroline, you want to take that? Yeah, so um, probably there will be uh, a couple of hundred rare variants, you know, in some of that. It, it could be, but I, I do think the big fish are out of the pond and uh, we have discovered uh, the majority of our genetic load. And uh, so adding a, a couple of, you know, the common genes, there will be maybe a couple of things that will add a little bit to the prediction, but, but not much. I mean, we've actually um, done, you know, the total risk score and then look to see if with the same prediction, you could get a minimal set and you can actually have a very good prediction with only uh, 26 variants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, let, let's, because there's one question um, asking about, um, do you offer genetic tests um, to your AMD patients? Are they asking for it? So maybe, um, uh, maybe all of us can take that question. Of course, maybe we start uh, with you, Caroline. Um, so do you use, do you offer these to your patients uh, in your daily routine? Um, so, yes, we get a lots of referrals for it because, of course, we, uh, we scream it from, uh, <laughs> from everywhere. So we do get uh, referrals spe specifically for genetic testing. So the genetic tests that I described that we used for the study, we're momentarily getting it to uh, function for the clinic. We can right now do only the complement genes, and we also measure complement levels in blood and we do it, you know, dualistic for, for patients, but we use it also for studies. Mm -hmm. Is that a clear proof lab then, Caroline, you use it in? Is it, a, is, it a clear, is it a clear proof lab you use? Like, like it's like a traditional, the clear CLIA yeah. proof? It's, yeah. it's the uh, Rothbard University lab, mm -hmm. the, the complement lab and the genetic testing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we also know what the other panelists are thinking about it? Uh, Nicole, what do you think about it? I mean, wh what are you doing in your daily routine? We we don't do it, um, actually. And um, no, so far, patients are not asking for it. And um, I mean, we do a lot of um, imaging biomarkers and, and try to score the risk for progression from that. But we do not uh, offer and, and don't do genetic testing so far. Yeah. Let me guess, Sandrine, in Switzerland, no one is asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, usually, actually, the, the patients in Zurich and uh, Switzerland are quite demanding, but yeah. no, they are not asking for genetic testing. So we also do a lot of, uh, let's say, multimodal imaging. We haven't implemented uh, dark adaptation and microperimetry in our uh, uh, daily clinical setting, although I think... Um, uh, Professor Holtz uh, actually raised this point that it's quite, it will be probably more important uh, also for the near future to differentiate between, you know, like these patients with early or intermediate AMD who are actually much more affected than we expect just from, uh, from the imaging data. Mm -hmm. And Rosa? Oh. Yeah, I also agree. We don't really use genetic testing uh, routinely, and we do uh, multimodal imaging and examination, but uh, they ask for the genetic risk, but they don't ask for genetic testing here in Spain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about uh, yourself, Anad? So I, I'll tell you, I do not do routinely genetic tests, but uh, we have a genetic center now in our department and they're just screening everyone for everything. They also be, belong to the consortium and it's part of a study or for re research, but clinically uh, we are not. I'm very interested, uh, Nicole, if I may, I know that we have many questions on the chat. How, and how does the FDA, Emily, approve 
of such a study that people are getting tempted to pay a lot for it and uh, there is no proof that it actually helps. Of course, I, I got convinced from Caroline that it's important, but it's not these tests that are uh, people are just buying for lots of lots and lots of money and no proof that it actually predicts something. How can the FDA approves of it and uh, how, how can we cope with such a situation? Well, the FDA has approved of the 23andMe, but I don't know if you see they approve of actual for AMD itself. They, they have certain indications. And what happens is, as, you know, it, it, is a, it is a place where, at least in the U.S., um, the companies come to the different practitioners, not so much the ophthalmologists. I, there, very few ophthalmologists actually order the genetic testing according to our PAT surveys that we've had at, at ASRS. But what happens is the optometrists do a lot of genetic testing. So I have patients come in and they say, well, what does this mean? I don't know what this means, you know? So it, it's, it's, it's kind of tough. So I think they do get back something that that's not quite as meaningful. I think you need someone to interpret the data and understand how it works. And, and that's where the education really is important, as Caroline said. So, yeah, so, so we don't do as much, but we do, people are getting some of it done through the optometrists. And it's paid for out of their own pocket. The insurance yeah. doesn't pay for it. I mean, uh, talking about the cost, um, uh, how, much, uh, how much is one test, Car Caroline? Yeah, so so we're still negotiating with the lab, but it will be around 100 euros. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great. Um, there's a question. I think that's something I also wanted to ask. Uh, how about AMD pharmacogenetics? I mean, I guess it would be great from, from, from the genetics to see which pharmacotherapy would work better for which patient. So is there anything in the near future that could predict uh, the treatment outcome from anti vegf therapies, for example? Maybe first Caroline, then Emily, or all of us? <laughs> yeah, I think people, when, you know, the genes first came out, people made uh, quite some studies about this, and nobody could really actually find um, a, a treatment response with the AMD genes. And then also people did GWAS on successful people that were successfully treated versus the non-responders. And there is, I think, one or two papers that are uh, that came out that, that lacked some validation. So in my mind, it's not going to be very um, elucidative there. Yeah, I don't think very fruitful. I, I agree with you, Caroline. I don't think it's very fruitful to do that. What have we seen so far? Okay, so what do you think if we have tests, who should these tests be offered to? Patients or care providers? Who should be in charge? I have to, Nicole, maybe I can relate to that at, the, at first. I, I'm really worried about patients being able to be offered that because if, I know that this is how, you know, modern times go, but I think there is a lot of abuse of the patients uh, with tests that don't have any validation. People are coming, it's it's scary, it's not always true. Uh, I, I'm, I would rather than the physician will be in charge still on that. I don't know. Uh, it's a little bit old fashioned, but uh, I, just no, because absolutely. you know so much proof about it. Mm -hmm. Sandrine, what do you think about it? Yeah, I uh, completely agree with you. And I think this is a very important uh, comment because it can also harm a lot. You know, when you do like, uh, uh, let's say, just a commercially available test and, uh, you know, there are only, let's say, like a few variants which have to be, which were tested, but not like the full spectrum. And just based on this, uh, you know, you you change your behavior, or um, so I think it's uh, it's uh, it's crucial that this at least um, is in um, uh, in the hands of experts. Um, you know that it's patient has the possibility to discuss it and not just get it on the counter and do like a series of uh, genetic testing. Mm -hmm. 
There's there's one more question. Um, that, uh, maybe Caroline, you want to take that uh, clarification for the costs. Um, the the amount you said was that the cost for the patient or for you in the clinic or I guess you're muted. Yep. Okay. Caroline disappeared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So some some trouble. So we will get back to that. Uh, later. Um, uh, there's another question um, from uh, the audience concerning fundus autofluorescence um, that is, of course, very useful in predicting late AMD progression. And um, uh, for example, other toxicity screenings um, versus genetic testing. I mean, maybe do you want to comment on that? Oh, maybe for yeah, no, sorry. Every time I press on my microphone, they throw me out. <laughs> um, so the question was um, the cost. Uh, is that for the, the cost? Or, or oh, for the yeah, yeah. So we are very lucky in the Netherlands that uh, still the healthcare system uh, pays for the genetic testing. And uh, so I, I always tell patients you will use lose your um, your own risk. Um, uh, costs, but uh, the tests, um, you know, all kind of genetic tests will be paid for by the healthcare services, uh, mm -hmm. the insurance companies. So, uh, and I, I do realize uh, we are very lucky. Okay, great. Maybe again, the question concerning um, macular target visual field exam along with fundus autofluorescence in prediction of late AMD progression um like a toxicity screening versus genetic testing what do you think emily so if that's is that more important than for prediction of progression uh first i'm sure fundus autofluorescence has some great uh you know great features so again it's probably a combination of things that's really important knowing what you have uh looking at the features and you know if you got or you got ga and fundus autofluorescence that you can't see otherwise Obviously, that's a very high risk as well. And looking at functional changes, we know certain things are associated with, with dark adaptation problems, and that certainly uh, people have shown longitudinally that you might you might actually progress faster. So clearly, those are tests we can do, uh, and we can you know predict. And and again, it's the combination of things that are that are really important, I believe, you know, for for the patient. But clearly, genetic testing for us is not even within the within reach. So so we have to deal with with what we've got. Mm -hmm. There was a question that is interesting, I think, that uh, people are asking, how can we explain, if we claim that there is a genetic tendency one way or another, that one eye has geographic atrophy and the other AMD, uh, and the other uh, neovascular disease? And Sandrine answered in the chat, maybe you want to elaborate on that, Sandrine, and then Rosa, uh, what do we think about that? I, I actually think that we, what you answered is completely right. Maybe you want to elaborate. You're on mute. Um, yeah, I think this is an important uh, question. Let's say maybe in the past we were more prone to say like late AMD has like two end stages. It's either neovascular AMD with development of hypervascular tissue um, scar and like the other end is um, atrophy. But now, you know, like um, thanks to the uh, um, innovation and the improvement uh, of uh, imaging technology, we know that very often the late stage actually has signs of neovascular AMD, but also of atrophy. And that's why uh, there are like some uh, new terms nicely introduced by the CHAM group. It's a, a panel of experts who defined uh, in more detail the different steps steps of development of atrophy, which are really um, 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 easily identified uh, on OCT. Um, for example, you have prior steps, which are called retinal atrophy, where you don't have an atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium yet. And maybe the patients already has like symptoms like um, um, uh, problems uh, with uh, endemic illumination or for a uh, dark adaptation, but you don't see 
um, what we usually would see in myomicroscopy, microscopy, what we have called in the past geographic atrophy. This term actually is now reserved first only for patients who have pure geographic atrophy and never had any signs of neovascular AMD um, in the past. So very often when you look at late stage uh, patients, you know, maybe it's not always so easy to differentiate if these patients had like years ago neovascular AMD and then, you know, the neovascular region regressed and it led to atrophy. And you look at uh, just like at the end stage, but the patient actually had the vascular AMD uh, prior to that. And Rosa? Yeah, I fully agree with uh, Sanreen. And also I will add that uh, this comment was, it's really, really important because it highlights that AMD is really diverse and we have uh, different types and maybe we don't really have all the information on the genetic pathway. And that uh, explains why we have patients with only atrophy at the end stage, but patients with also additional neovascular AMD. So I think we still have a lot of uh, to learn uh, there. Great. I think it's really, I'm really enthusiastic about the discussion. However, we only have one minute left. So Anat, uh, shall we wrap it up? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Nicole, for the great moderation and dealing with the questions and Sandrine and Rosa for your help in the discussion and the excellent, excellent talks of Emily and Caroline. Really a women power a panel. We are very, very proud and not to be the only woman in a panel of six men. And thank you for also to the... Uh, actually, it was the idea of our president to have all women panel, uh, and the executive board is mostly men. But we are happy to, we are happy to take it. And thank you very much. The talks were excellent, and the discussion was excellent. And your moderation, Nicole, was superb. So okay. hopefully, we'll see yeah. you again in the next debates. Yeah. Well, thanks to to Anat, uh, and uh, also thanks to the whole team of Uretina for the techniques and thank you the audience for following this debate and uh, yeah i wish everyone a pleasant evening thank bye. you bye 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 bye, bye. bye. bye.